I don't know if I like being spotlighted. Just get to stare at your own face the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit uh, disturbing. But... If I don't fuzz out the background, you get to see my bedroom. So parts of me disappear into the void. Okay, let's go ahead and start class. We'll make the mudra for the mandala. I'd show you how to do it, but I barely can do it anymore. Here's the great earth filled with the smell of incense covered with a blanket of flowers. The great mountain, the four continents wearing a jewel of the sun and the moon. In my mind, I make from the paradise of the Buddha and offer it all to you. By this deed, may every living being experience the pure world. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niryatayame. I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I achieve enlightenment. By the power of the goodness that I do in giving and the rest, may I reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I achieve enlightenment. By the power of the goodness that I do in giving and the rest, may I reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I achieve enlightenment. By the power of the goodness that I do in giving and the rest, may I reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. I have a refuge prayer that I made up after. Um, one of Geshe's teachings on the diamond cutter. So I'd like to offer that to you now, and I'm probably going to start using that from now on. So here's a different refuge prayer. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength, the Dharma, the enlightened side of truth, and the Sangha, the community of realized beings. From the virtuous merit I create from the practice of giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joyous effort with the understanding of emptiness, concentration and wisdom. May I attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all living beings. In the Diamond Cutter course, in one of the first classes, I guess you Michael said it would be a good idea to include the six perfections in your refuge prayer. And so that's what I've done. So I'm going to start using that now instead. Okay. Let's do a couple of review questions from the homework. So just raise your hand, if unmute and raise your hand if you've got an answer. What's the relationship between Tantra and the three principal paths? Anybody? Go ahead, Mike. If you practice the three principal paths, you'll just like kind of automatically be ready to uh, go into a tantric practice. Like that's the basis of tantra. Right. If you don't, tantra won't work if you don't follow the three principal paths. It's just really that simple. It's like the root roots of a tree. The um, Three principal paths lead, make a good root system, which a tree needs to survive. And some other vows make the trunk and your tantric vows make the leaves and branches. So if you're not connected well, like a, a, if the roots on a plant die, uh, the plant dies. So you have, to, you have to have a good foundation. That's what the three principal paths gives us. What are the two main causes for Buddhahood? Anybody? I can't see everybody, so. Renunciation and 
What he cheated? Uh, no, those are. Well, okay, we can use method renunciation and bodhicitta. What's the one that gives uh, the cause? What's the main cause for wisdom? Merit? Uh, Completion of collection of merit? A correct view of emptiness is the answer I'm looking for. What are the, when you teach the bodies of a Buddha, we can teach it in the two. Uh, two version, two body form. Uh, anybody recall what the two bodies are? Form and wisdom. Karmaka and Rupakaya? Yeah, the form body and the wisdom body. Okay. Let's see. What else do I want to ask? I think that was, that's good. Okay. So today's class is about a, what is a qualified teacher and why do we want to discuss a, about a qualified teacher? We need to because if you don't have a qualified teacher, you can be led down the wrong path in Buddhism, the completely erroneous path, which would be very harmful. So we need to decide how do, how do we find a qualified teacher? What are the the aspects of a teacher we're looking for. What makes a qualified teacher? Well, for my case, uh, Keshe Michael is the teacher. I'm just his student relaying his message. So I'm very careful as I teach to make sure that I'm, everybody understands when I have an interpretation that isn't strictly from the, the scriptures or from Geshe Michael's teaching. That's a very important thing. If, if you start listening to a teacher and they start going off on a tangent and you don't understand it, if it's something they've made up or, or it's their opinion, um, they have to be clear that, that that's what it is. So I'm very clear. If you have any question about anything I say, you should raise your hand and ask because I wanna be clear. Just like learning the piano, very few people are gifted enough to sit down and play the piano beautifully and understand the music. Most of us need a teacher. In a sports analogy, a coach to help us reach our goal. I do know uh, one student, one friend of mine, uh, another member of the Sangha, um, can play the guitar just by hearing a song. He can play it instantaneously. And that's, uh, I'm in awe of anybody who's a musician to begin with, but to be able to do that is, uh, well, I'm just in awe of that. I'm also in awe of anybody who speaks more than one language. I tried to learn French and got just good enough grades to be able to play basketball in high school. We had gone to England when I was an eight-year-old. I went with my father and parents, and mother, and the rest of the family to England for eight for a year. He went there on a sabbatical from the University of California at Davis. And so we were on the continent a lot. And why am I telling? I'm spacing on the story. This is getting to bother me a little bit. Oh, so we We went all over Europe, and as an eight-year-old, I was really impressed that there are so many different languages in Europe. So you can't, it's almost by default, you're going to learn more than one language, whereas in the United States, there's just English and variations on English between the various states. But I always thought growing up in Europe would allow you to, but it'd be so simple to learn another language. So I have a, an in-law who speaks six languages fluently. I have no idea how he does that, but okay. You need to have a criteria for who is a qualified teacher. There are many out there that seem to be qualified, but not when 
you really look closely. So this class is going to be about how to find a teacher and how to act towards them once you've found them. Lord Atisha, we'll talk about many times, is an excellent example of this practice. You heard of a famous teacher called Dharma Kirti, who was in Indonesia that could teach him the Bodhisattva vows. So back in the day, he undertook a very long sea voyage to get to Indonesia and then spent several months asking about Dharma Kirti, observing his students' behavior and his behavior before going and asking to become a student. Why is it important to be careful about who you select as a teacher? An unqualified teacher can really mess you up in this lifetime and even later lifetimes. If you teach you something that is non-virtuous, but say it's virtuous, and you just buy it and act accordingly, then you're going to set karma for the future that you don't want. A powerful example would be to be taught incorrectly about emptiness. That brings to mind, my wife and I first met Geshe Michael. Well, down the road, you're going to learn that one of the more complicated courses, befuddling courses, but extremely powerful course, is Course 6, the Diamond Cutter Sutra. That's where we really learn about karma and emptiness. And our first course with Geshe Michael was the Diamond Cutter Sutra, which we knew nothing about. So we're living in Tucson, we're starting to study Buddhism, and we see a flyer for an American monk that's going to teach something called the Diamond Cutter Sutra. So we just were excited because it was going to be an American monk and we didn't have to have the translation issues. So we go to it and he starts teaching about this karma and emptiness. I had no idea what he meant. But he taught it in such a beautiful way that it intrigued both of us to stay. So he could have taught it in a very difficult way and turned us off completely from Buddhist practice. But he has a gift for teaching, and he taught it in such a way that we really wanted to understand it. And that was our commitment to go and take all the courses. So what did we do? We went to the website and immediately ordered all 18 courses, the tapes. Well, I guess we only had tapes for 15. All the tapes and reading material for 15 courses. And they came in one huge box. We opened it and there was all the material. This is back when they had cassette tapes. None of you are probably old enough to remember cassette tapes, but it was really something. And that's when we started our classes. So the important point here is that Geshe Michael was teaching an incredibly hard subject, and he did it in such a way that we, who had never heard of karma, and we'd heard of karma, but we never heard of the concept of emptiness, did it in such a way as to want us to take the courses. And I'll never forget that. So hunt for a teacher. If, if I'm not the teacher you connect with, that's fine. It's more important for you to find a good teacher than it is to worry about whether you hurt someone's feelings by not showing up for class anymore. So, Lord Buddha said something that I think that's very, again, is these are the kind of things that drew me to Buddhism because when Lord Buddha said, if you don't believe what I teach, treat it like gold, melt it, cut it, <clears throat> and rub it. So if you don't believe if you don't believe something I say, melt it. This means to test it against your own direct experience. Cut it means to test it against your own logical analysis, whether or not the Buddha's words are internally consistent. And rub it. Do his words contradict an authority you reasonably believe to be speaking the truth? So where does this come from? Is cut it, melt it, rub it? This comes from the old way of assaying gold or, or precious metal. You had something called a touchstone. A touchstone is a piece of uh, shale-like material, and it, it's, a, it's abrasive like, like sandpaper. You could use a piece of sandpaper too, 200-aught sandpaper. So 
what do you do? You take a, a piece of gold. Let's say you have a, a, a ring that you want to know if it's 24 carat or 12 carat. So you have a touchstone and you have some standards, some pieces of gold that you know the content of, the carat content of. So you scratch the ring on this silica, on this shale, and it leaves a track. Then you take one of the samples you have and you scratch it above it or below it. And you can tell by the color on the stone whether it matches the color of one of your standards. So you don't have to do anything other than that. That's one test. That's the rub it test. The cut it test would mean you take something that you believe to be solid gold and you nick it with a knife to see if it's just gold plated. And then melt it, pure gold or any of the, any of the alloys of gold, 10, 12, 24 karat gold has a specific melting point. So if you have the appropriate thermometers and equipment, you can melt the sample and see if, so if someone came up to you with a bar of gold and said it's 24 karat, um, I want this much money for it. You could take a piece of it and melt it and monitor the temperature. And that would tell you whether it's actually pure gold or not. So cut it, see if it's gold plated, rub it to see if it's got, leaves a mark like the gold level you want or melt it. So we're asking you, if you don't understand a teaching, first of all, I recommend you put it on the back burner. You put it back and you, you think about it. You'll get to it. You don't dismiss it. Or you can test it by seeing if it makes sense against your own direct experience. That's melted, cut it, test it against your own logical analysis and whether or not the Buddha's words are internally consistent. Rub it. Do his words contradict an authority you reasonably believe to be speaking the truth? So here's an example from the scripture. There'll be a teaching we study that talks about killing your mother and father. Well, why would we kill our mother and father? That makes no sense. So at first blush, it's a teaching by Lord Buddha that doesn't make any sense. It's not internally consistent because he doesn't teach killing anything. So what's going on? Well, when you come across something like this, you need to think if it's being taught literally or figuratively. If it's literal, he's telling you to kill your mother and father. Well, it can't be that. Lord Buddha would never say that. I would never say that. Geshe Mike would never say that. So what's going on? It's figurative. And what that means is he's using that as an analogy. So when you're killing your mother and father, you're killing what gives you what gives birth to your mental afflictions, what gives birth to your bad karma, which is mental affliction. So by killing your mental afflictions, by stopping your mental affliction, you can reach Buddhahood. But you can see whether if someone who didn't know anything about Buddhism and didn't know about cut it, melt it, or rub it, or literal or figurative, it would sound completely nuts and that a Buddhist the high Buddhist practitioner, Lord Buddha, was encouraging you to kill your parents. So whenever I teach something that doesn't make sense to you, go through this, cut it, melt it, or rub it. Think about whether it's literal or figurative. And by all means, if you can't understand it, contact me and I will explain it. Or try to explain it in a better way, a more clear, clear way. Okay, so there are 10 qualifications for a true Lama. This teaching is taken from the Sutra Lamkara ornament of prose by Master Asanga in 350 AD. He was taught directly by Lord Maitreya, the coming Buddha. That's a long, long story. We'll tell you that one of these days. I have a question here. Who doesn't live an ethic life? I'm not sure what that question's about. 
you obviously want a teacher that lives an ethical life. We're going to get to that. So the first qualification, there are 10 qualifications you're looking for in a teacher. The first one's dulwa. Tibetan is dulwa. That refers to morality. Taming your immorality. The analogy Ken Ripoche used to use was like taming a wild horse. You practice self-control. The teacher practices self-control to a great, to a high degree, refraining, refraining from harming others in thought, word, or deed. So they practice the 10 virtues. So you'd want to check and see if your teacher's practicing the 10 virtues. So not killing, not stealing, no sexual misconduct, the three of body, the four of speech, not lying, no divisive talk, no harsh words, no useless talk, and three of mind, no craving, no will, or wrong view. Now again, when you see a teacher and they do something that doesn't isn't consistent with the ten practicing the ten virtues, you have to question what they're doing, whether it's they're trying to make a point or whether they're actually not following the ten virtues. So it's the, the point of these 10 qualifications is research who you're going to ask to be a teacher and make sure and talking to others like uh, Master Sangha did, make sure that you're fully aware of their history and their background. So for, for instance, for me, what makes me qualified to teach? Well, I didn't start teaching any of these courses until I'd done all 18. I felt that was how I could qualify and pass the Maroc exam. At the end of the 18 courses, you take a hundred question. Well, let me start over. There's something called the Maroc exam where you're, you're given previously a hundred questions and the answers to it. They come from the quizzes and the finals of all the homeworks and, and stuff in the class. You take the 100 questions, you go through and you memorize the answers or understand the answers, and then you're, you're up in front of a large group of people, and they take a question out of a hat, and they ask one of those 100 questions, and you have to answer correctly until they're satisfied. So the point of this is I didn't start teaching until I'd taken all 15 courses and done the review courses because I wanted to be as, as complete a teacher as I could be. That's the whole point of these courses is we're training you to become teachers. And hopefully all of you who are taking the courses will by the end of the 18 courses want to teach. I think it's, a, it's really a, an incredible thing that Keshe Michael, he could have just said, I'll teach, you listen. But he said, instead of that, he said, I'll teach you so that you can teach others who can teach others who can teach others and spread the Dharma like a virus. So I think that's very powerful and very admirable. Okay. Shiva, peace, to be at peace. They have recollection and awareness, well mastered, meaning they can, they're well trained in holding their mindfulness and concentration on their virtuous behavior and avoid violating their morality, not just sitting on their cushion. <clears throat> That's an interesting thing, sitting on the cushion. A lot of people talk about doing their practice in the morning. A very good, very powerful teacher of mine, Salim Lee from Australia, once was teaching and he heard that and he stopped what he was teaching and he said, your practice is 24 seven, it's all day. There's no such thing as if you finished your practice this morning, your practice is all day, period. You don't, your meditation will, you'll leave on the cushion in the morning or the evening, but your practice and get used to it. Your practice is 24 seven. Okay. Number three, near Shiva, they have high peace. Really, this means that they have had the direct perception of emptiness. 
but it can also mean the ability to analyze this, analyze one's reality, emptiness of themselves and their world. I have not had the direct perception of emptiness. So does that disqualify me from being a teacher? For some people, it would. For other students, I, I study emptiness. I practice my life with emptiness and karma and emptiness in my forefront of my mind and my actions but I haven't seen emptiness directly. So the first three are mental qualities your teacher should have. So they have high morality, they're at peace, they have high peace. Number four, Lungi Chuk, rich in scriptural knowledge. They must know what to teach. It's important to know what to teach to what students. The scriptures teach about the decline of Buddhism over time. The ability to meditate will die out. The books will become hard to understand or they'll be destroyed. So one thing Geshe Michael is doing very powerfully and very successfully is finding as many of the books in the Tibetan, hidden in the Tibetan monasteries around the world and the archives in, in Russia and getting them translated scanned and copied in digitally so people can look at them and then getting them translated. So rich in scriptural knowledge. If I took one course and started teaching, which some people have done, if you take course one, some people say you can teach course one. I personally think that you should take all 15 and the three review courses before you start teaching at all because there's so much to learn and once you've taken all the courses, you go back and look at course one, and it's even more rich and full of information than when you took it as a student or taught it. So deep scriptural knowledge. One thing I did to make sure I had access to this quickly is I took all the PDFs of the readings for the courses. I took all the answer keys. I took all the student notes, and in each case, I compiled all, all 15 courses into a single PDF for the answers, a single PDF for the readings, and a single PDF for the student notes. That way I can quickly look up, if a student has a question, I can quickly look up if I don't know the answer, the answer right from the reading or the student notes or the answer key. So to me, that feels partly feels rich in scriptural knowledge. I've made it so I can get to the information I need to quickly. And I give that to anybody that wants it. Okay, number five, Denny Rob took deep realization of suchness. This refers to having the direct perception of emptiness. It's hard to know because normally people don't say much about it. Keshe Michael has told us more than once that on 28 July, 1975, he had the direct perception of emptiness. So I believe him from his teachings. I have no reason to doubt him. Jason Kapa says, even if they have not had the deep perception, the direct perception of emptiness, they should have had a, they should have a deep intellectual understanding of it. Now I won't pretend I have a deep intellectual understanding, but I believe I know I live my life along the lines of karma and emptiness. I can teach it to a reasonable degree. So But if you're looking for someone who's had the direct perception of emptiness, the only person I know is Geshe Michael. Well, I don't know his holiness personally, but I believe he's at it. So, so that can be a criteria, but you might be looking for a long time because normally people don't talk about it. Okay. Now, number six, Yuntun Lakpa, good qualities in excess of their students' abilities. Um, 
Well, I've had some pretty sharp students in my life, and I'm not sure that they're not in excess of my abilities. But, but the difference is they haven't taken all 18 courses. So I have a lot of students that ask very profound questions. In fact, I had one from this class. I'm not going to mention her name, but it was a really profound question. I just struck me as for a beginning student, struck me as a very profound question, made me think quite a while. Had a nice discussion with my wife, who I call the Oracle, because she has a better memory of the material than I do at this point. We had a very good discussion about it. Never be afraid to ask a question, please. I'm here to help you learn or direct you where to to learn where to find the material. Number seven, should be a master instruction instructor, able to understand the student's abilities and capabilities and teach to that level. We had Geshe Michael before his first three-year retreat, well, it's only three-year retreat. He would often go to the University of Arizona to teach because there was a Tibetan club and they'd invite him to come teach. So one day we're there at the teaching with him. There are about maybe 50 students in the audience. And he starts teaching about karma and emptiness. And he's clearly the students are getting restless and some of them get up and leave. And so he stops what he's doing. He recognizes the abilities of the students and that particular day and time, those students weren't interested in learning about karma and emptiness. So he switched and did a meditation. I don't remember what the meditation is, was, but he recognized the abilities of his students and he taught to the, what they could use. The only trouble with Zoom is I can't follow all of your expressions and, and attitudes uh, on Zoom. It's very hard with this many students. So I can't tell if I'm boring people with tears I guess I could tell if they turn their camera off and turn on mute their microphone, and that's pretty obvious. Nobody's done that yet, but I guess there's always a first time. So it's it's important to be aware of and aware of your students' capabilities, what their interests are. Now, sometimes you have to just go ahead and teach the material, like logic. I'll be quite frank. Course 13 leaves me cold. I'm not a good debater. So do I not teach it? No, I teach it to the best of my abilities. But I let all of you know that if you want a really good course 13, you're going to have to hang on and struggle with me. But the important thing for me is by the time we teach course 13, that you all of you are much better educated in Buddhist practice. And often I find my students can help me teach course 13, which I really enjoy. Okay, that's number seven. Number eight, Sewa Dakni, teach out of love and compassion, out of a desire for fame or fortune or the respect of others. I'm not making any money doing this. I don't do it to make money. The best, the highest offering a student can give me is to practice what I teach them. That's not to say money's not nice, but if I was to, you were to come and see me, or I was to watch you in, in your daily life, to see you practice what I teach is so much more gratifying. It's hard for people to understand. Um, I know teachers that say, keep telling people how many students they have. And back when we started teaching, I went to South Africa to do my first teach, some of my first teaching. Um, the word got around Diamond Mountain that they needed a teacher in South Africa. Well, I like to travel. This is back in about 1993 or four. Wow, 30 years ago, ouch. 
So I, I said, I'll go. And I went and I was met by one student. I taught 15 students. It was wonderful. I had a wonderful time. The next year I went back and taught about 15. And the year after that, I taught about 15 different. I went and taught the courses that needed at the time. If you wanted to take course 16, 17, and 18, it had to be taught in person. So why am I telling you that story? I had no idea where I was going. I knew I was going to South Africa, Johannesburg, but I had no idea what level the students were. I was pretty well stepping out in the middle of nowhere doing, assuming I could teach. It worked out very well. I have some lovely students I kept in contact with and still teach. So I, went, I wanted to teach. The reason I went was it was a chance for me to teach Buddhist philosophy using Geshe Michael's tools to people I didn't know from Adam. That's to me is teaching out of love and compassion, not for the desire of fame or fortune or the respect of others. People ask what I do. I write books on nuclear weapons and I teach Buddhist philosophy. If they ask how many students I have, I say enough to keep me busy. I don't rattle off the numbers because the numbers aren't important to me. I'd rather have a few students and good students than a lot of bad, uh, disinterested students. If one person asks me to teach, I teach because I never know if that one person by teaching them will make a difference in their life. I have one very dear student who I, has made a tremendous difference in her life. According to her and her mother, um, that just makes me so happy. One student. That doesn't mean that everybody else doesn't make me happy, but I have this one special student that really brought to my attention the, the importance of teaching at any opportunity you have. So I think that that's an important. Say we dakni, you teach because you, you love the subject and you want to spread the Dharma, not because you want to collect students. Number nine, Sunchi makes effort, takes great joy in helping others, joyous effort, having fun helping others. I have, I have fun pretty much every day of my life, even now with Parkinson's. I have jokes I made. I'm still trying to make up more jokes, but I haven't. Well, here's a new one. Just made this one up. So, why do you not want a financial advisor who's got Parkinson's? Because their advice would be on shaky grounds. Get it? I think my humor doesn't translate. Oh, well. Maybe I'll stop telling jokes. Okay, and number 10, beyond getting discouraged and never tired of repeating explanations. I've said before, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, the only stupid question I can find is one that's not asked. If you have a burning question and you don't ask, then and go off on the wrong path, that was, that was stupid. So it's not so much a stupid question, it's not asking the question. So let's go back over the 10. High morality, you practice self-control to a high degree, practice the 10 virtues. If you see someone not practicing the 10 virtues and you think you want them to be your teacher, Think of two things. It's your karma ripening to see that, which we'll be discussing in greater detail later. And two, they may be doing something to teach a lesson. Now, there are a lot of vows that I have where the exception is I can break, I'm not breaking the vow if I'm doing it to teach a lesson. But I don't do that. I don't can't think of when I've done that ever because it's easy to rationalize something like that and make it okay to do when it really isn't. So whenever I find myself going, 
well, I really shouldn't do this, but it's okay. Because I'm using my special powers or whatever. I stop it. I don't do it. Now, does that happen very often? It used to. But it doesn't happen much anymore because I've, for the most part, cleaned up those issues and don't even do those actions anymore. We were talking about renunciation, a good example of renunciation that everybody who can try or can accomplish, that's becoming a vegetarian, renouncing the killing of food of animals for to feed you. That's a huge renunciation. Used to be in this country, it's very hard to find vegetarian food in a restaurant. Now that almost every restaurant has vegetarian dishes. Vegan's another story. Trying to get vegan food in most restaurants in the United States is, is difficult. But when McDonald's puts out a plant-based burger, you know vegetarianism has hit the mainstream. One of the one of my favorite foods, I love Mexican food. I just I love it. And we when we first moved to Tucson, we were really enthused about coming and eating good Mexican food in practically any restaurant. So we'd go to restaurants and we started, we didn't ask the the lard question to begin with. The best refried beans on this planet are made with lard. But as a vegetarian, we can't, can't eat them. So I'd have to start asking the lard question when we went to restaurants and had Mexican food. And pretty soon we'd, we'd ask the question, they'd say, no, we use canola oil. So that was great. So we have a new Mexican restaurant very close by to where we live. And they took it over from the previous owners. And we went there to eat the first time didn't ask the lard question because we just assumed they'd not cook with lard. Well, we started eating the refried beans and realized they were really good. Well, they had lard in them. So now my wife doesn't want to go to that restaurant. So I ask and she doesn't want to go. So that's a, that's a, um, a little conundrum we have. I ask, cause I'd like to go. She says, no. I honor her not wanting to go because of the lard, but I still want to go. So I said, let's just go and not order the refried beans. She said, nah. So the secret to some 40 plus years of marriage is when, you're, when your husband or wife says no, you just say yes, ma'am. She's right most of the time, but the key word is most of the time. Every once in a while, She's wrong. But it doesn't happen very often. Okay, so the high morality. Let's go to the next one. Peace. They're at peace. They have recollection and awareness, well mastered. My meditation practice is pretty bad now because of my tremor. I try but I don't succeed very much because my mind's distracted by trying to keep my body from having the shakes. As high peace. I don't get it. The only person I get mad at now is me. And that's in usually in my office late at night. So in the sense of, if you see a teacher that's always angry and yelling at students or berating them, it could be a reason, or it could be that that's just their teaching style. And you have to decide whether that's how you want to be taught. I don't like, I don't, I try not to put my students on, on the spot. For instance, when I ask a question from class, I don't isolate one of you and say, please answer the question. I don't know if any of you or all of you are taking the course for credit. If you're not taking it for credit, then you may not have done the homework and the quiz, in which case asking you 
the answer would be could be putting you on the spot. So I don't do that. Does that make me a bad teacher? Because I'm not demanding all of you take it for credit. You could think that, and it's, you have every right to think that. But I'm more interested in introducing the subject to you and hopefully encouraging you to pursue, whether you do the homework and quizzes or not, to pursue your study of Buddhism using the ACI course. One thing I have found is you, if you don't take, if you get seven or eight courses under your belt, and then you decide this, you want to start taking them, then you have to go back and do it all over again. So the simplest thing to do is do the homework and quizzes now. Take the final. Then it's done. You get a certificate and you can move on. The first course we actually took was Diamond Cutter. We did the homeworks and quizzes for that not really understanding what we were doing because we didn't uh, until the end of, he taught it in two weekends but that's what got us started because that's how we learn i learn best with a didact the didactic method which is where you listen to a lecture you take notes you study your notes you do a homework and a quiz and then you go to the next class that's what really attracted us. Besides Tegeshi Michael's beautiful teaching style, we like the idea of having homeworks and quizzes because that's how we've, we learned in college. And that's, that's how learning Buddhism made, made really good sense. The homework is the most important questions out of the teaching for that day. The quizzes are the most important questions out of the homework. And the final comes from the various questions on the quizzes. So when you take the final, you've got a summation of what you learned in the course, which is a really handy way of knowing what's important to teach. It has high peace. Like I said, I have not seen emptiness directly, but I think if you followed me throughout the day, you would see that I am try very hard to put my my understanding of karma and emptiness into practice. Lungicho, rinse in scriptural knowledge. Um, I tell you what, let, um, let Alejandra know if you want copies of those, the stuff I compiled. And then uh, I'll, oh, I know, I actually, I wanted to do this. I would like Alejandra or Marina or somebody to send me all of your emails so I can put that into my computer because I got an email from one student, uh, Cornelia. The reason I didn't answer right away was it went to spam. And I just happened to be looking in spam and saw your, your message. So what I'd like to do is get the emails for everybody that way and put them into my contact list. That way, if you email me, it won't bounce and get kicked into, into spam. So please do that. Uh, the best way to do that would probably be through Alejandra. Well, the heck with it. I'll give you my, I gave you my email before, but here's the email you should use. Sumati, S-U-M-A-T-I, all one word, D-E-C-20. So Sumati, DEC20 at gmail.com. So send me your email address and I'll put that in my contact list. And then I won't have a problem of having your stuff bump into spam. Okay, rich inscriptional knowledge, we covered that. Dini Rabtuk, deep realization of such this. I have not had that. Good qualities in excess of their students' abilities. I think a good quality of a teacher and one that I try very hard to, uh, to do is to understand when I don't know the answer to a question. 
I just admit it. There's nothing more embarrassing to me as a teacher. It would would be embarrassing to me as a teacher because this has not happened to me is to say something and have someone look at me in the audience and raise their hand and say that's absolutely totally wrong now they may be wrong if i'm if i know if i say something and someone says that to me and i know that i'm right i have no problem but the problem develops when you you want to answer a question and not look silly so you make up an answer so for instance, I was teaching, I was on a book tour for one of my books. I was talking to about 50 um, Air Force officers that man the Minuteman missile silos. And we were, I was giving a talk and one, a guy asked a question and I could have answered it with just something off the top of my head. But if I did and he looked at me and he looked at me and shook his head, I'd be very embarrassed because I I didn't want to look bad. So I'd make up an answer hoping he didn't know the answer. I don't do that. I looked at him and said, you know, I wrote the book. Quite frankly, I don't remember that particular detail in the book. Come up after the lecture and we'll go over what the answer is. That's as a teacher, that to me is what I'm looking for in a teacher is someone who is willing to go the extra mile to not, not necessarily look good by having an immediate answer, but being able to find the answer and get it to me later. Okay. Master instructor, instructor. And I think that example of Keshe Michael at the University of Arizona. Oh, we were in Germany once at one of his teachings. And he was in front of a group of about 700 people. And people started to get up to leave. And he immediately changed what he was doing. And people were, that were leaving actually came back and sat down. So sometimes the example or the topic you're teaching isn't of all that much interest at that time to the student, students. So you have to be aware of that. You have to, to analyze it and react to it. Sometimes you have to just say, suck it up and, and this is a tough subject, but we need to get through it. So each out of love and compassion. I teach the Dharma because it's the best way for me to learn the Dharma. As I said earlier today, one of the fascinating things to me is having gone through all the courses, having gone through the Tantra courses, I come back and I see just how much wonderful material is buried in these introductory classes. So it's very rich. And it's up to me to make sure you get the best and the most out of each of these courses. And I try my best to do that. I, I really, I, I look forward. I think you should look forward if you're gonna teach to taking these courses and going back and looking at them years from now and realizing just how much information there was that you may or may not have understood at the time. I have a good example of putting something on the back burner. I have a, a digital copy of something called the Abhidharma Kosha, the Treasure House of Knowledge. It's a wonderful reference book, but it's very, it's hard to understand. Even Geshe Michael's translation he did with Ken Rinpoche is hard to understand. So one day before a class, before we start taking the ACI courses, before a class, I was reading a particular section of a chapter in the Abhidharma Kosha, and it made perfect sense to me, absolutely perfect sense. So I didn't take any notes because it made perfect sense. I was really looking forward to that night, teaching it to the student, to our, my friends. So I got to the class. They said, what do you have for us? I said, here's this section out of the Abhidharma Kosha. And I started to, to read it and talk about it, and it made no sense at all. So did I give up? 
Did I try and teach something I didn't understand? No, I said, let's, let's go through this together and see if we can make it make sense. So that's the difference between my reading through something, giving an interpretation and making it look like I understood versus saying, I'm, I have no idea what this chapter means tonight. Let's go through it and try and figure it out. And we did. And we came to some good conclusions, as I recall. Okay. Makes great joy in helping others. I think we've talked about that. Yo Pang, beyond getting discouraged. I'm trying to think what would be a good example of my getting discouraged about teaching. Hmm. I can't think of discouraged about teaching. No, I've had very few students that have disappointed me. I don't get this. I don't get discouraged about pretty much. Well, I get discouraged. I can't. I'm not allowed to climb up ladders anymore or get on the roof or stand on a chair to fix, change the light bulb. I think I can still do it. But my doctor says no, because I'm on a medication. And if I bump my head, I could die from an aneurysm, which obviously is not something I want to have happen. And I'm at the age where falling off a ladder would probably not be very sharp. One of my wife's, she was a physician assistant for many years. And one of her supervising physicians took a step off a ladder. He was, he was on the roof. He started climbing down the ladder and he broke both ankles getting off a ladder. Both ankles. I can't even begin to think what breaking both ankles would one feel like and what that would do to, for you to get around while it healed. So whenever I think of getting up a ladder just once, I think of two things that would happen. One, I could break an ankle, which would be really annoying. Or two, my wife would find out and I'd be in a world of hurt. So I don't do either. Okay, so satisfy yourself through investigating the qualities of a teacher. My wife and I used the 18 ACI courses as a way of investigating Geshe Michael to be our tantric lama. His high respect for his teacher is the desire to teach the courses for free and distribute them for free, all helped form our opinion as, as well as attending other teachers' offerings and seeing how well his teachings matched theirs. So that's another thing. You go to, you, you take a course from me or from another ACI teacher you go to another teaching by another uh, teacher, maybe in another city. And if their teaching doesn't agree with our teaching, then there's, there's something wrong with one of the teachings. And then you have to figure out which one it is. But what was beautiful about with Geshe Michael is we go to another teaching with Lama Zopa or, or um, Yes, she sold to him while he was still alive. Well, either one was still alive. The teachings were pure and clean and beautiful and dovetailed completely. That was another reason we knew that Geshe Michael was the teacher we needed for Tantra. So if you want someone to be your root lama, you need to ask three times. That's a tradition. You don't ask three times and you don't say, can you, will you be my lama, will you be my lama, will you be my lama? You ask three times and you make an offering, the three separate times. They become a very powerful karmic object. You have to be careful about that. What does serving them mean? There are lots of lama devotion ideas out there and no one group of them fits everyone. For me, the most important Lama devotion, if I'm become your Lama, is to practice well what they teach, what we teach. 
I served Geshe Michael with very strong devotion, learning how to and building the water system at the retreat center. And I was uh, its operations manager for eight years. Was I constantly at his side? No. Did I serve him meals daily? No. Did I do what he asked me to do? Yes. And I did it with joy. I had no idea how to build a water system. I'm a plant biochemist by training. What do I know about engineering? Zip. I wanted to be an engineer, but I may have told you this story. I wanted to be an engineer, but realized that calculus and I didn't get, get along. And I didn't want to drive over a bridge that I designed. So I decided I shouldn't be an engineer. So here I am building a water system. He asked me to do it. I did it. And I did it with enthusiasm. And it worked very well. Your meditation is still analytical meditation on renunciation. You can ignore the homework question on what a kalpa is. We'll be getting to that later. So if any of you have any questions, I can only see four people on the screen now. Um, maybe someone can let me know. If you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand or unmute and ask. No. Hi, Lama Samadzi. I do have a question. Is your type teacher same as your root Lama or heart Lama? Or it will be different people. Um, ideally, your root Lama. Well, it's hard to say. They don't have to be the same. Let's say you ask me to be your 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 root Lama. And I accept. And then you ask uh, my wife to teach you Tantra. That's fine. Or ask Geshe, or you go to Geshe Michael. Now, the right thing to do would be to say, to come to me and say, I've asked some this person to be my root, my Tantric Lama. Um, and not asking my permission, you're telling me you did it. It happens to be my root Lama and my Tantric Lama are the same person, Geshe Michael. But it's not always the case. We went to a teaching when we got a tantric initiation before Geshe Michael came out of his retreat. And this person we stayed with had a meditation teaching Lama, had a scripture Lama, and they had a mantra Lama. And they were all different Lamas. That's their tradition. Good for them. Thank you. You're welcome. That's the first time anybody's asked me that question. Good question. Anybody else? These courses are supposed to be two hours long. And at the beginning, there was a lot of discussion and banter back and forth. At the very beginning, Geshe Michael was not respected by the students. There were several students who I met down the road, and very nice people but they felt they could be teaching the course as well as he could. And so they'd interrupt on the tapes and, um, and that took time. They'd ask question after question or argue with him. So that took time. And in some cases it would be short because he had to go to India for his work. So, so don't be discreet. Don't get too comfortable with them being only an hour long. At some point, we'll go to two hours, and you'll wish you'll remember the days we only had one hour classes. Okay, let's dedicate this for uh, today. And we'll wish you a happy weekend. Excuse me, a happy rest of the week. Okay. By the goodness of what I've just done, may all beings complete the collection of merit and wisdom, and thus gain the two ultimate bodies that merit and wisdom make.
Thank you for the opportunity to teach. I relish doing this. I enjoy doing this. It's always nice to see your faces and know that we're discussing the Dharma. And at some point we'll be more discussing than we'll be having me teach. But that's a little ways down the road. So. Have a good week. We'll see you on Thursday. Right? Yeah, Thursday. And if Cornelia is still listening, if you'll stay online for just a minute, Cornelia. I wanted to talk to you about the recipes they sent you. No problem. That's why we record them. So where'd Cornelia go? Cornelia. So yes, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, whatever. So have you tried the recipe? <laughs> The, the cupcake. Thank you. <laughs> did, did that work? Sebastian, yes, it yes. works. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. The uh, cookie recipe, I like that for kids because it's just a big, one big cookie. I think okay, that's... yes, you wrote that. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for asking and I'll... Um, Oh, maybe I'll share some more recipes. Okay. Great. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Could I ask a question real quick? Sure. Um, so with the it's about class two. So yeah. No, okay. Can you see? Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um so there's method and wisdom. Yes. And method is renunciation and bodhicitta, and wisdom yeah. is correct view. Yes. Right. And then there's merit, collection of merit, and collection of wisdom. And is that just collection of merit is practicing method, which yeah. is right. renunciation and bodhicitta? Right. And collection of wisdom is just practicing wisdom and correct view. Right. Exactly. Okay. So okay. the important thing about merit, I've looked for definition for merit for a long time and finally found it again in my notes for that class. Merit is, wis is virtue done with wisdom. That's what makes merit. So doing a good deed, but doing it knowing, for instance, um, that's a good example. Um, well, I can't think of one. Well, something as, as innocuous as holding the door open for someone. If you do that without thinking, just no, holding the door open, they walk through. That's good. That's virtuous. But if you say to yourself, "I'm," and you say it to yourself, not to them, because they'll think you're a nutcase. Um, you hold the door open. You go, I'm doing this because in the future, when I, I'm doing this now because, with wisdom, because in the future, I know this is what's going to allow me to get help when I need it. And it's important to not think of it being the door you're opening that's going to ripen as someone else and open you a door. And my interpretation is you're helping someone. So the karma for you getting the help down, you're the help you need down the road, maybe a door opening, maybe someone helping you lift something into your car because you can't do it anymore, or maybe helping you get a teaching, those kind of things. And right. that to me is the fun of, of trying to figure out the karma puzzle, is figure out what you did in the past to make what's ripening in the present so you can make what you like, so you can have it ripen in the future. Right. And then the obstacles to omniscience and obstacles to reaching freedom obstacles to omniscience are based around uh collection of merit that that's obstacles to renunciation and bodhicitta 
Right. And then the obstacles of reaching freedom from mental afflictions is uh, has to do with uh, correct view of emptiness. Because if you can't have the correct view of emptiness, then you can't be free from your mental afflictions. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because it's like there was like, you know, it's like method and wisdom and then the collection of merit and wisdom and then the physical body and the dharma body and they're all related to like you know they're yeah, all related yeah. it was just a bunch of different things that like kind of mixed around and yeah well, i was just making sure that what i like to do is i like to make a a tree you start with collection of merit you start with merit and underneath merit what's the definition of merit it's virtuous wisdom and then, then what does that involve in actual everyday life? Renunciation, bodhicitta. What's mm -hmm. renunciation? What's bodhicitta? So if you follow it all the way down, you get down to the definitions that are the basis for the entire thing. Right. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll see you on Thursday. And what do you do for living? Oh, I do all sorts of stuff. I'm sort of, sort of a <laughs> jack of all trades of e-commerce and uh, oh. uh, basically a merchant slash musician. <laughs> oh, what, I play what, uh, what, piano and I do like dueling piano shows. So like all requests. Wow. Live candle, uh, piano shows. And I have a candle company and I have uh, wow. mycology supply company and I do reselling and e-commerce and wow. yeah. Kind of an out of the box <laughs> wow. job. Well, that must keep you busy. Yeah, yeah. But on my schedule, though. So it's like yeah, that's the beauty yeah. of it. Yeah. Right. One thing about retiring, um, I think I'm busier retired than I mean. I I spend hours a day working on this book. Although that's soon to end. It looks like by the end of this week, I'll be sending off the rough draft to get it critiqued by a friend who's a grammarian who I remain friends with, even though he tears my books apart. But, but once that's done, I'll devote myself to developing that list of Tibetan book of lists. I'm really looking forward to doing that. Okay, take care, be safe, and we'll see you in uh, three days. Thank you. Могули я задать вопрос? May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, um, about uh, um, I I will speak in Russian, okay? And okay. I need translation. Svetlana, do can you help? Yeah. Да да да. Говорите на у меня вопрос по шестиразовому дневнику. Будет ли у нас отдельное занятие и по шестиразовому дневнику? Потому что я не понимаю, как его вести. Да. И как правильно делать эту практику? Okay, so I'm going to translate. <laughs> uh, 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 it's, it's not, uh, the question is about six times book. Um, Yelena is asking about will we have uh, a class about this topic? Uh, because she doesn't understand uh, how to practice six times book and uh, uh, how uh, to make it as a daily practice. Okay. Um, well, I can make it part of it. I tell you what, let me, um, I will make a note to teach that as part of the next class. So it isn't really part of the next class, but I'll teach it. Svetlana, can you please translate me, please? Поберите, пожалуйста, русский канал, но уже на русском канале. А, да. я, я, я на русском канале вроде бы. Прошу я ее освобождала, поэтому у вас потерялся канал. А вот, да. Перевод. 
Да, спасибо. Okay. А на следующем занятии, да, будет? Правильно я поняла? Thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll, we'll teach that, we'll teach that on Thursday. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No? So I have one more question. How, <clears throat> how many people showed up for class today? <clears throat> Can someone share that information with me? Around 18 with tech team. I don't know who is student. I think we have around six people tech team and ours, I think it's student. Okay. I was just curious. Okay. Well, we'll see everybody Thursday. Thank you for all the help, technical people and recording. And just, and thank you Svetlana for handling my translation. I'm in awe of anybody that can do that. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.